Chick, chick, chickity, chick, chick. All right. Good evening. Welcome to what is today? Monday? I've lost all track of time. Uh, welcome to our Monday VBS. We're glad that you're here. Hey, Johnny. How are you, man? Sorry you had to listen to me. Uh, but we are glad that you're here. We are talking about the life of Jesus tonight. Um, I think it was the plan for this to be just about Jesus' miracles, and I didn't get the memo. So you can imagine, as I was assigned this topic and thinking about what to talk about, the life of Jesus in an hour. I had, a, I had an old gospel preacher friend one time tell me, he said, if you need me to speak for five hours, give me five minutes. If you need me to speak for five minutes, give me five hours to prepare. And that's kind of how I feel. The life of Jesus in an hour, what do you, uh, what do you leave out? The, the story of Jesus, the life of the Christ, the Messiah, the man who was God, God who was man, flesh that dwelt among us, the person uh, and deity who has meant so much to all of us. And here we sit in vacation Bible school. Uh, we get to see the kids having a good time. They get to go do crafts. They get refreshments. We finally talked everybody here into letting us have refreshments a few years ago, so that's good, but we still haven't talked them into letting us do crafts yet. They don't trust us with uh, sharp objects and glue and stuff on the carpet, so, you know, there's that. But we are glad that you're here. Thank you very much. Our apologies for your speaker this evening, but uh, it is what it is. Suck it up. Deal with it. One of the things that you need to know about me is that uh, I, since my mom was very proud of the fact that from the time I was about a week old, I've been in church. I was raised by Christians, members of the church. I, my granddad was a gospel preacher for a long time. My great-granddad was a gospel preacher for a long, long, long time. Wrote a lot of books that many of you have read. Uh, my other grandfather was an elder in the Lord's Church in Southern California, and if you've ever traveled around anywhere, you know that's a, that's a different deal than being an elder in the Lord's Church in Texas. Uh, come from a long line of preacher dudes and people who believe and believers, and so it's kind of one of those things that just my whole life, understanding that Jesus is the Son of God is a given. And yet, that didn't keep me from messing up my life. Didn't keep me from sin. Didn't keep me perfect. I know a lot of you agree with that. You can name in that one. It's okay. Uh, you know, you, I still needed the sacrifice that Jesus, the life that he lived, the death that he gave, the, the resurrected Christ. You know, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it's something that while I was raised by Christians in a Christian household with many generations of Christians teaching me, and kind of expecting, and that expectation, and that bar being really high, doesn't change how powerful that message is for me. Doesn't change how important this life is. You know, we, we live in a day and age, we're looking back some 2,000 years, what new is there to bring to an audience of church-going people on a Monday night about the life of Christ? But the same old gospel preacher friend of mine told me one time, the Bible's been complete for some 2,000 years. If you think you found anything new, think again. So a lot of this is going to be stuff you've heard before. A lot of this is just going to be a refresher course, if you will, of things that you're very familiar with. Uh, and if you're not, some really, really wonderful stories. I'm glad we all moved down front. Very happy about that because I am a guy who likes a lot of interaction. We probably won't get as much tonight as we do in a lot of classes, but that's okay too. But I did want to start this class with a question. And feel free to answer. You can holler out if you want. Uh, no jumping around the aisle. We don't want any of that stuff going on. But you can absolutely tell us. And my question to you is this. What's your favorite story about Jesus? Fish in the bread. His resurrection. Okay, somebody already said it. Don't say it again. That's a good one. What about his life? What stories in his life are the ones that you think about, are familiar to you, that are favorites? Washing the disciples' feet, that's one of mine too. Couldn't that one work, couldn't work that one into the next hour, but that's a great one. Calm in the storm. Uh, the, 
the command he had over the things that he created. The sinful woman who washed his feet. The compassion he showed to the widow when he resurrected. Yeah. He had a mom. And he had a mom that he loved. And he had a mom that he cared about. And he had a mom that he wanted to make sure was taken care of when he was, when he was gone. The, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept at the resurrection of Lazarus. George? Yeah. Always time to talk to people about the Father. Anything else? What, what did he write in the sand? Uh, if we have time, we're going to get to that one. We'll see. Uh, yeah, the woman caught an adult. You know, the, so a theme that we have here is the compassion he had for people, right? The, the relationships that he had, the people that came across his life. You know, one of the things that is striking, you talk, we talk about the life of Christ, and, and he was 33 years, right, roughly, let's say, around 33 years on planet Earth, and yet really we only know a lot about what we talked about last night, the birth, and then three years, right, of his ministry. Um, and a lot of that is on the final week, a lot of it. Um, when you think about, that's right, uh, when you think about how much of your uh, Bible is dedicated to the life of Christ, you know, it's about, it's about that much right there. You know, you could, if you, if you wanted to, you could sit down and start to read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 and finish the end of the book of John in an afternoon. It's just not a lot. Now I want you to think about all the things that have been written about him since then. All the radio programs about Jesus Christ. All the movies. The Broadway plays. All the different kinds of art that are dedicated to, to this man, this God that became flesh. All of the things, and yet God had a few things to say that he wanted us to understand, a few things that he wanted us to glean, a few things so that we can understand things about him. And the stories that are our favorites, right, the stories that are important to us, the stories that were important to be recorded here, a lot of them have to do with relationships. A lot of them have to do with his interaction with people. Either our relationship with God, God's relationship to us, Jesus' relationship with people in his life, the relationship of the people in Jesus' life, both with him and with each other. Just so important, the idea and the value of relationships that the Gospels put on the relationships. A lot of value. Tremendous, tremendous. Turn, if you would, uh, to John chapter 20. This is where we're going to start. We're going to read a lot of scripture tonight. Luckily, we have time. But John chapter 20. This was alluded to in the puppet show that we saw a minute ago, uh, but it's really, really important for us to understand why these things are recorded. Uh, but if all of the things that Jesus did had been recorded, you know, it just had been volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes. And so only a, only a handful of the things that he did in his life are actually put, put down on paper, things that uh, God decided to pass down to us, things that we needed to know. And there's only one reason why those things are written. One reason why we need to understand them, one reason why we need to know, and it's in John chapter 20, starting in verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, his, in the, presence of, his, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, there's so many things that we know, so many things that Jesus did, so many things that we don't know, and yet what we do know and what we are given and what we're going to talk about tonight and the things that we do understand about the Christ are, are really given to us for one reason, and one reason only, and that's so you might believe that he's the Christ. That's the reason. 
Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, as Chris talked about last night. He lived his life, lived it perfectly, although he was tempted. He was the perfect sacrifice for sin. He was God who came down here to have a relationship with us. And yet the reason these things were written down was not to glorify Jesus, was not to glorify his life. or his, It was so that we can know that he is who he says that he is. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. In John 8, we're going to read uh, a little bit here about an interaction that Jesus has uh, with the Pharisees, basically. And, and he's talking here in John, there are, there are miracles in John, there are signs in John, there are wonders in John. And then in John are what we call the I am statements of Jesus. And one of the most, one of the things that is really interesting, I think, when you start thinking about who Jesus is and what he claims to be and uh, us believing that Jesus is the Christ is, did Jesus actually ever say, did he ever claim to be, did he ever uh, say out loud that he was God? Did he claim to be God? Did he claim to be the Son of God? Did he, claim, did he make that claim? Because if you think about it, a person who would make that claim and that's not true of is, that's, that's blasphemy. John chapter 8 Verse 12, Jesus says, Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So they start this dialogue with Jesus, where Jesus says, Here's something that's true. And they say, Well, that's not right. And Jesus says, Well, here's something that's true. And they say, Well, that's not right. And this goes on. Look down in verse 25. So they said to him, Who are you? She said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are the offspring of Abraham, have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So he's talking to these men, he's talking to these people, and they're just arguing with him. He's telling them one thing, they're arguing with him about, well, that can't be true. Well, he's telling them something else that's true, and they're saying, Well, that can't be true. Verse 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. Verse 44, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Verse 48, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Now they're starting to name call. Tell him he's crazy. Tell him he's been possessed. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Verse 52, the Jews said to him, now we know that you're, you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, you will never taste, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? In verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. It doesn't seem like that odd of a statement for Jesus to make. He's taught from our perspective, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is eternal, Jesus was at creation, Jesus has been around him and part of the Godhead for all of eternity, has no beginning. And what he's actually doing here with the Pharisees is he's throwing something in their face that they really hold close to their heart. When Moses was talking to God about going into Egypt, Moses said, what's your name? 
Who am I going to say sent me? And God says, you tell them, I am. And that's what Jesus says here. He equates himself to God, to a group of religious zealots who believed in the Mosaic, who as were subscribing to the Mosaic Law, who were uh, absolutely Jewish through and through, who held close to their heart the personal name of God that he had given to Moses to tell Pharaoh. And Jesus uses that name to identify himself. And from our perspective, verse 59 seems like it's a pretty quick rush to judgment, doesn't it? But they picked up stones immediately to put him to death. Because the people that were there understood exactly what he was saying. I am God. I am who talked to Moses. I am who talked to Abraham. I am who talked to Isaac and to Jacob. The God that you know so well from the Old Testament, your Bible, that's who I am. Now in the book of John, Jesus goes on to list a lot of other I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the light of the world. A lot of them are in this passage that we just went. We don't have time to go into all of these. But Jesus didn't just say to the Pharisees at this point, I am calling back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. He said it over and over and over and over and over again. There is no doubt that Jesus claimed to be God. Now, a man who claims to be God, you got to do something with that. What are we going to do with that? Well, the Pharisees picked up stones to end him. You know, for the rest of Jesus' ministry, he was constantly waging this war of, I'm going to die. They have already decided that they're going to put me to death because from their perspective, Jesus, Jesus had committed blasphemy. One of the things we need to understand from the life of Christ is that he gives you no choice he gives you no choice but to do something with the claims that he made in his life. You've got to decide what to do with Jesus. He claims to be God. Now these people had a hard time with that. I don't think that is as hard for us as it is for some of them. But I did want to get a little bit more into some of the teachings of Jesus. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. John is my favorite gospel, and a lot of my lesson came from John, but we're going to go to a few other places because the stories are better or more well-rounded in Matthew and Luke. John chapter 6, verse 66. There are people in Jesus' life who are witness to what he says, listening to what he does, seeing what he's capable of, and... There comes to different times in Jesus' life where he, I don't want to say he was self-conscious and doubted. I don't think he ever doubted. But I think it took his toll. You know, the fact that people didn't accept that he was the Son of God. The fact that he was rejected by so many. The fact that he knew so much, did so much, taught so many truths, and yet ultimately ended up on a cross. And in John chapter 6, he actually turns to his disciples. He says, after this, in, chapter, in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus turned and said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And then listen to Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Don't you love Peter? So many things about Peter that, you know, I wish I was. <laughs> I wish that, uh, you know, he talked so fast that I got down. But he, he just was so willing to 
just be out there in front. You know, he was all in every single time he was ever asked for something. We're going to get to this a little bit later when Jesus walks on water and that miracle. But, you know, Peter, Peter is just such a unique person. And at a time when Jesus is a little bit down and he turns to his friends and he says, well, you guys going to go away too? He's starting to lose people because of the things that he's teaching. They're hard things. They're difficult things. Are you going to go away too? And Peter says, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Isn't that an innocent perspective? What else is there? You have the words of eternal life. Now some of the things that were difficult, turn over to Matthew chapter 5. We talk about the teachings of Jesus. Now, there's so many things, so much uh, that we can go over, but I wanted to just really quickly kind of get into what is probably his most famous diatribe. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's in three of the Gospels, three of the four Gospels. In Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, really may have been different times all glommed together by Matthew, but uh, so many wonderful truths here. And I want you to pay attention to what's happening as Jesus progresses through these teachings. Look at, look at verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, the Beatitudes there in verses 2 through 11, I'm not going to even read them. We don't have a lot of time to go over them. But look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. So the very first thing he gets to is our relationship with the rest of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You people who follow me, you people who are my disciples, you people who subscribe to this way of life, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light. Salt and light. Such an important thing for us to understand. This is about relationships. That this is us the world teaching and leading them to the Christ. And then Jesus, oh, sorry about that. Go back one. There we go. Uh, Jesus down in verse 17. So many people had a misunderstanding of what Jesus was going to be when he came, right? He was going to overthrow the oppressor. He was going to redeem it. It was going to look a whole lot like when uh, Israel came out of Egypt. And that was the idea. And here is Jesus sitting down on a mountain with a multitude of people, and he's just starting to talk to them, just starting a discourse uh, as their teacher, as their rabbi. And he wants to make it really clear that the things that you've been taught weren't empty, right? They weren't wasted. They weren't for naught. They weren't without value, but they also weren't perfect. Does that make sense? I, th I think a lot of times we think that you know, these things have been done away with and abolished. But look at what he says in verse 17. Do you think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You know, we, a lot of times I even mentioned a minute ago that the, the things that are given to us about the life of Christ take up very little, relatively speaking, of our Bible. But you know, you're going to find Jesus in every single book of the Bible. Every single book. There's something about Jesus. Right? The, the point of the, the entire Bible up to the cross is pointing towards the cross. Right? The creation of this idea that there were going to be Christians, that Jews and Gentiles would be reconciled, that all the, all the divisions and the differences in the laws would be done away with, and that everything would be unified. And here was the Christ come, and he just makes the point to him real quick. He says, look, I understand that, most of you, that you're Jews. I get it. I haven't come to do away with your way of life. I haven't come to get rid of it. I haven't come to, I've come to fulfill that. 330-something prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. Who he was, what he was going to be, how he was going to be betrayed, how much he was going to be betrayed for, who he was going to be betrayed by, what it was going to look like when he died, how he was going to be put to death. So many prophecies. And he says, that's who I am. And the thing you need to understand is that your way of life, the thing that you've done, it's, it's not that it was empty, it's not that it was without value, it's not that it was meaningless, it's that what we have, as the writer of Hebrews says later, what you have is better. Because it's been fulfilled, because it's been completed, because it's come to fruition. But listen to what that means. 
this fulfillment. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. You know, Moses in his law says, Thou shalt not murder. Who gave Moses that law? God himself. Don't murder. And Jesus comes and says, Look, I know you've been told don't murder. Well, who were you told by? You were told by God. Well, who are you? Well, I'm God. And I know that I said don't murder. But that wasn't the end of it. That wasn't all of it. Now that you understand that, now that you've learned, now that we have this relationship, let me explain something else to you. Don't get angry. Don't belittle. Don't run down. Don't name call. Is that a lesson we need to hear today? You know, Moses said, and God told Moses to say, don't murder. But I'm telling you, hey, control your mind. Control your emotions. Control your attitude. Because that's where murder comes from. Yes, that's true. But this idea of what a Christian life is versus what Judaism was, the law of Moses, is a raising of a standard. It's not a setting aside of one thing and putting in place another. It's a raising. Don't murder. Yeah, don't get angry. Keep going. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Verse 27. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Standard raised. Don't lust. Again, you have heard that it was said, verse 33, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Verse 37. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Raising of the standard. You have heard, thou shalt not murder, don't get angry. You have heard, don't commit adultery, don't lust. You have heard, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, I say, let them have whatever they're asking for, right? Don't retaliate. Don't resist. It's no wonder he was losing disciples, right? This is not easier than Judaism. To the Pharisees especially, who had designed this intricate checklist of things to be right with God, this was hard. This was difficult. This was not going to be easy. Time and time again through Jesus' life, he was sa it says that people no longer followed him. This teaching was hard to accept. This was difficult for them. They didn't understand. And then he keeps going. Chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Who is he talking about now? The religious hierarchy of the day. Right? The people that you look to as the religious people, don't be like that. Verse 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And when you fast, verse 16, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, they disfigure their faces and their fa that their fasting may be seen by others. So we've taken this old law and raised the bar to this new law, and now we've taken the current religious climate of the day and said, don't be like that, do these things in secret. Pray. Fast, give, don't do them out there. Because your religion's in here. You see how much of this has to do with the inside, the inward, the spiritual, the, the part of you that, that is the hardest to control, right? That pride, 
that pride that wants to be seen giving, that pride that wants to be seen praying, that pride that wants to be seen as religious. Don't do that. Really have a relationship with me. Just us. That's, what's God, that's what God has wanted since he kicked us out of the garden was to be back in a relationship with us. Look at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Spiritual treasures, not material. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? We can read all the way down through the end of the chapter. He's talking about, what are you worried about? God takes care of the lilies. God takes care of the birds. And you're, we're so much more than that. And yet, what do you do at night, at the end of the month, when you're out of money? You worry. What do you do when the Joneses buy a new car that you couldn't possibly afford without barring yourself into a prison of debt? You worry. You're anxious. You're wound up inside. And Jesus is continuous, continuously telling us, be better, be better, be better, right? That's the lesson. Uh, judge not lest you be judged. Verse 7 of chapter 7, ask and, it, seek and it, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open. Again, this is talking about prayer. Look at verse 12. Starting to get to the end of the sermon. Think about how long this sermon was, if it was one sitting. No wonder people were hungry. Verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Everything that you know, everything that you've been taught boils down to this. There's another place where he says it boils down to this, love God and keep his commandments and love your neighbor as yourself. And here what he says is, do to other people what you want done to you. Be nice. Sometimes I think we read through these teachings and we're kind of taking them for granted. Does that make sense? I want my kids to be able to say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I want my kids to be, you know, sharing and caring and loving, and yet somebody wants to take something of mine or infringe on something of mine, even in church, even at church, how dare you sit on my pew? You're all laughing because you all have a pew. How dare we, right? Some of the worst pain we feel in life is brought on us by other people that we worship with. Because we expect so much more. We want people to see this as a raised bar, to be better, to be more whole, to be kind, to be gentle, to be loving, to be compassionate. And then they're not, and then we're let down, and then we're hurt. It's really easy to think that I'm preaching to everybody else. Are you kind? Are you compassionate? Are you loving? Have you raised the bar for yourself? Are you the kind of person who meets this standard? Are you trying? It's important. Jesus said so many things in his life that seem to those of us that are raised in the church so trite, so given, so fundamental. These are powerful things. Powerful, powerful things. And finally, and we did sing a song about this earlier with all the kids. Everyone then, verse 24 of chapter 7, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. What's your life founded on? Material possessions? Retaliation? Pride? Anger? Do you feel good about yourself because... You feel good about yourself? Or are you confident and pleasant and compassionate and excited and loving? Because God 
so loved you that he gave his only son. That's a faith that's hard to shake. You put the faith in the things you have, you put the faith in your friends, you put the faith in yourself, you put the faith in your job, you put the faith in how great your kids are, trust me, that one will get you quick. Put your faith in all of these things that are not good things and your faith's going to get shaken. But you put your faith in Jesus Christ and he'll never let you down. Never let you down. That was point number two. All right. Parables. A uh, lot of parables uh, that we could go to. Let's see. We got the parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the good Samaritan, the parable of leaven, the parable of the pearl of great price. Uh, so many. Anybody have a favorite parable they like? Come on, parables, really? Prodigal son. Turn to Luke chapter 15. It's like we rehearsed it. This is my favorite one, too. Anybody have another one they want to share with us? Because you're wrong if it's not the parable of the lost son. But if anybody wants to share another one, we'll be glad to take your incorrect answer. No? All right. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus here, Jesus, one of the ways that Jesus taught wasn't just directly uh, teaching things like, uh, you've been told don't murder, uh, and I say don't get angry, but he also spoke in uh, not riddles, not riddles because they weren't, uh, he wasn't trying to trick people, but he was, he used parables because he wanted seekers to find and basically people that were trying to trap him, people that were against him, adversaries to make it difficult to understand. Does that make sense? Uh, there is something very rich and nutritious and rewarding in studying your Bible. And I know that that seems trite. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Every time I teach a class, I feel like it all comes down to read your Bible and pray. And it really does. I know that that seems very fundamental, but read your Bible and pray, and you're going to be all right. That's the truth. Study your Bible. As we mature, as we grow, as we start to dig, and you start, you start to just be enriched by the Scriptures. George, how old are you? You still learn stuff from the Scriptures? 78. Missionary. Been preaching forever, like 100 years. He's only 78, and he's been preaching for 100 years. So many sermons, so many Bible studies. You think you know it all? You think you learned it all? You think you know so much? that you can't dig in a little bit more? It's so important to study our Bible. Uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. He said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And the father divided his property between the sons. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And there he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And yet no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." Treat me like a slave. And he arose and came to his father's house. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And they said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, 
who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost as in fa- and, is, and is found. Now, the lesson here, obviously, coming after the lost coin, uh, after the lost sheep and the lost coin, is that it's really, really important when someone who's lost comes back in the fold that they can be found again, right? That they can be saved, that they can be brought back in. But because this is the adult class in VBS, and we're going to get to some real fundamental things here, uh, a lot of things about the younger son, the prodigal son, the lost son, right? He took all the stuff, he went away, he did a lot of bad things, uh, squandered his wealth in living that wasn't moral, and had nothing. Came to himself, right? This is, the, this is the teaching, the parable that we go to to talk to people about what repentance truly is. A coming to yourself, a getting up out of the pig slop and marching back home, right? It's this, it's this idea that I have done wrong, I'm going to quit doing wrong, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to turn around, I'm going to go back the other direction, repentance. But because of the, what this class is, I want to focus on the older son here for a minute. You know, a lot of times in this parable, we think about the lost son, and we think about the father, we think about the dad, and we equate that to someone who's lost and God and and somebody coming back to God because they've wandered away, but I'm not so sure that's the biggest problem we have in the church that's alluded to here in this parable. We certainly are to be evangelistic, and we certainly run across people who don't know Christ, and we certainly teach them Christ, and we certainly want to lead them to Christ and help them to become obedient to the gospel and to God's plan of salvation, certainly that's all true. But when we have somebody that comes back, when we have somebody that's repented, and we have somebody that shows up here who's lived a life in pig slop, as it were, are we accepting? It's hard, isn't it? Because the older brother's not wrong. My brother took all this stuff and went away and squandered it. And I have done nothing but be good. And now here he comes back and you're taking him back in? It's really easy, I think, to not put yourself in the shoes of the older brother and understand that that's a real danger for us. We see people all the time who have driven their life off the rails. And a lot of times they come back and we reject them. God doesn't. Don't mean that. We. We bow up. We think we didn't do that. We didn't cause those problems. Those problems are self-inflicted. We, did, we don't look like that. You, we didn't live that rough life. The person who's right here is the dad. It's got to be a way back home. There's got to be a way to come back. And that's hard. I think a lot of times we look at God and we think to, to ourselves, man, thank you, Lord, for accepting me, for all the things that I've done, all the stupid things I've done for my life, all the things I've squandered, all the things that I've ruined. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And then somebody walks in that back door, comes down front, wants to repent, and we think, wait a minute. Did they really? Can we let them be part of our family? It's hard to do. And the lesson here with the older brother is, don't be angry. Because you've always had the blessings and the things that God has to offer. You never left. You never had to live in pig slop. You never had to worry. You never had to, you never had to get to that point. And it's good that you're good and that you've been here the whole time. But when the lost son comes home, celebrate with me. Help me rejoice. Be glad for the people that find Jesus. And accept them, not for who they are, not for who they were, but for what God has done for them. 
Because we're all sinners, fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus, through his whole life, we don't have time to do this, but one of the things you know is absolutely true about Jesus that just drove people absolutely bananas is how many, the people he associated with, how many of them were prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. These aren't the kind of people that we're supposed to hang around if we're religious folks, right? And what was Jesus' response? It didn't come for the healthy didn't come for the people that are well off. I came for the people that are sick, for the people that are dying. I came for the lost. Don't ever forget that about Jesus. And more importantly, never forget that we were lost. I was lost. And so when someone who's lost comes here and wants to get back into God's good graces, how can I help? What can I do? Let's kill the fatted calf. I don't think we'd do that today. It would be nice. I like, I like meat. There's a lot of ways people rejoice. I like red meat. You can see that. Hubble. Funny guy sitting on the front row. All right. Favorite miracles. What's your favorite miracle? Huh? Favorite miracles? All right, yeah, see? Okay. You two. I got to pay some people, man. Walking on the water. That's my favorite miracle. Raising of Lazarus. Raising of Lazarus is a... I think that might be becoming my favorite miracle. Uh, that's just so... It amazes me that... They wanted to kill Lazarus as much as they wanted to kill Jesus. Like, that's just such a, that's a great preaching point. It's a terrible thing that that's what they wanted to do. But just a great sermon in there. You know, they, and they wanted to kill Lazarus because here's this guy that was dead walking around. And all he's doing is just a, he's just a beacon of light. And this guy is the son of God because he brought me back from the dead. So we got to kill. We can't just kill Jesus now. Now we got to kill Lazarus. But that guy was dead. He got resurrected and brought back to life. And we got to go kill him again just so that, we can still be there. It's crazy. Another one? Anybody else? Matthew 15 is where we're going. Matthew 14. If you're wondering. Matthew 14. No other miracles? All right. Uh, the woman that was healed, and he didn't even realize, yeah, the, from the discharge, that she, and, uh, he touched her. She touched him. And she was healed, and he knew it. So many interesting things about that story. Yeah. Casting out the demon, the demon-possessed man. The, yeah, is demon plural? The demons-possessed man, huh? Healing the centurion servant. Good. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Oh, I got you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in John chapter 20, that verse we read at the beginning, not all of the miracles of Jesus are given to us. If you, were, if, if you were a disciple of Christ and you were going to pen a book, would you leave any of the miracles? Like, doesn't that seem like a weird thing to omit? And John says blatantly, look, I didn't put them all in here. <laughs> They're not all in here. That maybe is one of the most amazing things I read in the Bible is Jesus performed miracles we, we don't even know about because they aren't recorded for us. And yet there's enough recorded, again, why? So that we might know that he is the Christ. All right, cookies are calling our name. I'm going to use the minutes that Chris gave you yesterday. No apologies. Matthew 14. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him, verse 22, sorry, and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. 
And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Here we go, one of my favorite people. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So many things about this story. Uh, so many things to talk about. Uh, but a couple of things I wanted to point out. First thing is, Jesus in his life, I didn't have time to make this its own point, but you need to understand, Jesus prayed a lot. Jesus, being the Son of God, God who became flesh and dwelt among us, spent a lot of time with the Father. Usually, I mean, it was, it was a lot, but most of the time he was alone. Uh, if you think about the garden, when he went with friends, what did he do when he went to pray? You guys stay here. I'm going to go pray, right? Uh, really, a lot of things that you can learn about your prayer life. Jesus, being somebody who knew all there was to know, understood a lot of things that maybe we'll never understand, uh, saw so much, never doubted, never sinned, and yet there he was at a time in his life when he needed to be recharged, re-energized, rejuvenated, encouraged. And how did he do that? Didn't go to Six Flags. He didn't go fishing. He, you know, he, he went up on a mountain by himself and spent time with the Father. And he did it all the time. All the time. You, Jesus went off by himself to pray. Jesus went up in the mountain to pray. Jesus went off to the, pray. He prayed, pray, pray, just praying all the time. And he sends this time to pray after having dealt with these multitudes and the di disciples have been sent off. We don't know if they got tired of waiting for Jesus or, or what the deal was, but they went off. And Jesus comes walking out on the water, which you know, Jesus, right? I mean, <laughs> boats are kind of pointless, right? If you control nature. Um, it's amazing to me how many of the things that we learn in the third grade as little kids that as adults we kind of think to ourselves, yeah, walking on the water. Walking on water. People don't do that. Well, one person did it. Two people did it. When they saw him, they were scared. When Peter realized it was him, hey, I want to come out there. Right? That's Peter. That's my, that's, that's my guy in the Bible. I want to come out there. And he jumps out of the boat and he starts walking on water. How many people in the history of the world have walked on water? Jesus, Son of God, Christ, God incarnate, the Word becoming flesh, and Peter. That's it. Now, a lot of times we tell this story and we think, yeah, Peter just failed. Yeah, how many other disciples got out of the boat and walked on water? Zero. Nobody else walked on water. Now, Peter sunk, right? And the, and the text says he saw the, he saw the waves. He, the idea definitely being that he, he took his eyes off Jesus and lost his focus. So many things that we can talk about here. But just real quick, I just want to share this with you. Storms in life come. And it's stories like this that are written to, to convince us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. When the storms come, don't forget that Jesus is the Son of God. And I know that sounds weird to say, but don't forget that Jesus is the Son of God. And two, when he makes an appearance, don't freak out. Because when you're going through storms, the only reason you don't see Jesus and the only reason you're surprised by his appearance and the only reason that it shocks you when he shows up in your storm is because you aren't looking for him. But he's going to be there. And when you jump out of the boat to go be with Jesus, you commit your life to Christ. You start that walk Know that the walk is easier to start than it is to finish. And it's all about the finish. 
A lot of people have started their lives as Christians. A lot of people have entered into that discipleship role with God, with Jesus, and fallen away, fallen short, and not finished. When you struggle, when there's storms, when you get access to Jesus, don't let go. Because there's going to be so many times that you trust the boat, or you trust yourself, or you trust your material possessions, or you trust the things in your life, or you trust the people telling you how great you are. And we all need Jesus. And Jesus is the Son of God, a man who calmed storms, who walked on water, who raised the dead, who healed the blind, who made people whole physically. And the whole reason he did that, all the miraculous, wonderful, crazy story things that he did was so that you might believe. That's it. It wasn't about his glory. It wasn't about him being famous. It wasn't about him being popular. It wasn't about retweets and likes and all the stuff that we put a lot of value on today. It wasn't about a bank account. It wasn't about a big congregation. It wasn't about a lot of followers. It was about you believing that he's the Christ. And that believing you might have life in his name. That's it. Jesus' life. A lot of stuff. A lot of things that he did. A lot of people that he touched. A lot of stories that we've been told since we were third graders. He claimed to be the Son of God. He taught in such a way that people were shocked at his teaching, at what he brought, at his understanding, at his ability to deliver, at his willingness to stand up in front of the religious hierarchy of the day and saying, you guys, you guys got it wrong. That's not right. His, his willingness to demean himself, as it were, and to eat with the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Right? He, wasn't, he wasn't your typical big-time guy. Son of God. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, performing sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after sign, after sign. for one reason. So that you might believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that changes a lot in your life. And it's easy to say, harder to do, harder still to do consistently. Worth it. Every day, worth it. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. You know, there's so many things about Jesus that we have learned, that we know to be true, that are there for our understanding, and you can study your Bible until you're old as George, plus a lot of years, right? And still learn new stuff. But never forget what it's all about. It's about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. We're going to talk more tomorrow night. We're going to talk even more on Wednesday about what that means for us, uh, both now and in the future. Uh, but for now, this lesson is yours. Let's uh, say a prayer to end class.